Oh, hello. Finally, we meet. Welcome to 2063 and a radically transformed textile industry. You caught us in our dressing rooms, production sites, and design moods. Let us just put something on. What hangs in here is digital, one-of-a-kind, regenerative, on-demand. Dethreaded, rethreaded, seeded, tested, healed, redone. Each piece that much more precious when it meets a need beyond the want. Some regulate our mood, express a dream, and keep us warm. Some can protect our health, feed soils, clean our oceans, store old carbon. Everything in here is accessible to all. Equal access to our commons, turned everyone's prosperity, turned trust. Some pieces tell the stories about those who made them. Stories of leadership, of difference, of love, bravery, of triumph. Everything's considered in our pick. Artificially collected, automated, transparent trace. No human could keep track of it. What serves all best will be our choice. Ah, that one. That absorbs the pesticide remnants. The bees last month, now it's the frog's turn, human helper, AI says. Algorithms here weigh equally our voice. The power shifts made that all our choice. Uploading an idea as we get dressed. It's okay if it is never used. So much of what's uploaded never is. That inflow of new ideas gives us space to evolve. It gives diversity of responses, backup plans, and everyone a role. Creative inspiration stems from feedbacks and constraints. System knowledge, futures literacy, regeneration, put to work. To this competence, we test not only what to wear, but check incentives, regulations, how to empower us to dare, to go even further. We never take without a give. It's social justice. We're environmental justicing. It is not a state we've reached, but a balancing act, a work in progress. We could not have come here without the first few. Yes, you. With sharing your own thing came our access to everything, the riches you unlocked. Not the kind of riches you knew in your time. No, we don't loan from the future anymore. Even though back in the day, our now for all earth worked for just a few, it came a point when everybody knew that what had appeared to be owned was really high interest loans from all of us. Parts of the system led alone put more than one in our debt. What followed was a mess. It was hit and miss there for a while, creeping closer to two degrees. Heat waves struck. Each one took not only people and material, but knowledge accumulated over time. To this day, we don't know what was lost. We suspect it was a lot. Garment workers, crop producers, politicians and consumers, suppliers, brands, designers, activists, media and scientists joined the leading seat intervention to say the least, all represented to balance what was out of whack. The technical solutions had been around for a while. Now you could, with vengeance, act. Know-how spread like wildfire, social and eco movements on the boards, crop producers turned designers, workers entered leading roles. Designers got to know farmlands, air clearing, not just in the global north. Some brands got into politics, advocating the incentives they had missed. Others felt a little sore, but you started long before. The hardest part was not the new, the technical or very cool, but shedding the old, the long overdue. Back then, when delaying was the new denial, and many tried to look the same, strived for dopamine, no lasting gain. Some said, or maybe they just thought it, that climate change will not affect me here. Some said, or maybe we can hear the shouts, but I'm doing it right now. After years of just work, no life balance, you called out imbalance. Like that, you gave us 2063. How impossible it seemed, yet possible. You made this industry. You rose to face your Waterloo. What is it? And pushed through. If what we have told turns out true, then in fact, we owe you. <clears throat> Dear friends, we are clearly in exactly this point of imbalance. At 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming, we're in the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. We've caused imbalance. We are in deep climate crisis. We're in deep ecological crisis. We're losing the resilience of the life support systems to enable this return to a balancing act. 2065 is the charge, and you are keystone actors in that innovation pathway. In fact, we have so limited space left 
for a safe and just landing, that the conclusion scientifically today that incremental change, however good it is, won't do it. We need exponential transformations and we need to start scaling innovation and equity at the global level to have a chance to land. This morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, there was an update of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, latest assessments of the remaining global carbon budget for a safe landing. You may remember six months back, the conclusion was we have still 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide for an orderly phase out to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius. That translates to the carbon law, inspired by the Moore's law, an innovation pathway of cutting emissions by half every decade for a net zero world economy within 30 years. This morning, the budget was cut by half, from 500 to 250 billion tons of carbon dioxide. The reason? The more science we get, the more fragile the Earth system comes out to be, the larger is the risk in terms of extreme events and losing carbon uptake capacity, and we continue emitting greenhouse gases, 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. Divide 250 by 40, and we have something like six, seven years left in the current economy before we start moving towards that deep imbalance. Now is the time to move. And we have so much evidence to support this. We will, in a few weeks' time, publish the third scientific update on planetary boundary science, showing that of the nine big environmental systems that we all need to be stewards of for a stable and resilient and, for us humans, desirable state of the planet, six of them are outside of the safe space. So it's not only climate, it's also biodiversity. It's freshwater, the bloodstream of the whole biosphere. It's the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles that are behind all the textiles that we produce in the industry that you so much innovate and work within. It's about land configuration, the big biomes. We need the temperate forest, the boreal forest, the tropical forest intact, not only for carbon uptake capacity, but for ecological functions such as stable water supplies. But it's also aerosol loading, it's stable oceans, it's chemical pollutants, also associated very strongly with the textile industry, and the protective stratospheric ozone layer. So there we are on a pathway where we need to become stewards of the entire planet, and every industry needs to connect to the entire planet. Two weeks ago, the Earth Commission came out with the first time we did an assessment, not only on safety, but also on justice, the social and Earth system justice that would, uh, was, was conveyed in this introductory remarks for this phenomenal session here today. For the first time, it's a real scientific breakthrough. For the first time, we've been able to quantify scientifically not only safety to keep the planet stable, but if we care about people, also justice. And not surprisingly, the space shrinks even further if we care about people. So if the safe boundary for climate is 1.5 degrees Celsius, the just boundary is closer to 1 degree Celsius if we want to avoid significant harm to hundreds of millions of people, and we just have to open the papers every day, and not least what's happening in Europe right now, in Spain, in Italy, the heat waves, the droughts, but of course, the big devastation in Pakistan, for example, two years ago. So that's where we are, and science is now serving this transformation pathway. Now, haven't we been warned about, warned about this before? Well, yes, 50 years ago, we have the Limits to Growth Report of the Club of Rome. You all remember the readings about the 1972 doomsday analysis that sometime in the 2020s, if we continue business as usual, you would start seeing a drawdown of the global economy because of over-extraction and use of natural resources. Scientifically, this has been proven, unfortunately, that we're following this pathway in many publications. But a few months ago, we published the 50-year update of the Limits to Growth Report in a project called Earth for All, coordinated by the Club of Rome, including economists and scientists across the world, looking at two scenarios for the future. One that we call the business as usual scenario, too little, too late. Still doing what we can, but being in an incremental mode. You know, working on COP15, trying to continue on the climate negotiations, trying to implement the 500 multilateral environmental agreements we have, but still in a linear fashion. But then also a giant leap, really having exponential transformative change, scaling novel ideas across five big areas of change. And we plug this into mathematical, physical models to have checks and balances, to really measure 
whether we are able to have prosperity and equity for all within planetary boundaries. That's quite an achievement. It was two years of work. And what we find across the giant leap uh, transformation areas, which of course, number one is to eradicate poverty in the world, to really have reform of the financial sector, the trade sector, so we have a better wealth redistribution and, and, and lifting people out of poverty as also a measure of, of bending the demographic curve. The second one is really to have a more just redistribution of all wealth. We have so much science showing that trust and stability in societies are higher in societies that have a better redistribution of wealth. So this has even been quantified, that 40% um, um, of the income among the richest should be redistributed so it never exceeds 40%. Today, the 10% richest have far beyond 50% of the income in any nation. You know these numbers of inequity. The third transformation is, of course, the energy transition, a decarbonized world economy by 50, 2050. The fourth one is a food system transition, or all biomass, everything that has to do all from textile to forestry to food, needs to transition back within sustainable and healthy pathways. And the final one is to have a gender and equity capacity development transformation, to invest particularly in girls' and women's capacity development in all societies in the world. When we plug all these the knowledge we have on this, the scientific literature and quantifications on this into the model and do the best we can on trajectories. It's just, you know, we almost bring us back within planetary boundaries by 2050. So the conclusion is that even if we do the best we can, if you look at the documentation we have today, the state of knowledge today, we, we can make it, the window is still open, but it's really barely there. We can hardly hold the 1.5 degree Celsius limit. We can hardly halt all biodiversity loss. So my, my message to you is to say that you as, as innovators and as, as front runners in the transformation of the textile industry, remember this, that the planet is so small and the world has become so big that nothing but exponential transformations at scale are now required. It is possible. It is not only necessary, but it will require all hands on deck and a real pathway which is accelerated. Now, what is interesting as a closing remark is that in this idea of unleashing exponential change, we are today mapping, which will be presented at COP28, at the climate negotiations in Dubai later this year, not only the negative tipping points when you push big systems across irreversible changes like the Green Ice Sheet, but also positive tipping points. Can we see evidence of innovators and keystone actors being able to unleash unstoppable positive social change? And we have empirical examples of this, and we have it even in, in modern time. You can see the coal phase out in the UK being such an example. The fact that today, nine out of 10 cars sold in Norway, a small example, but still, nine out of 10 cars are either hybrid or electric. It's a tipping point. We see these tipping points from everything like abundant slavery to passive smoking. This is the kind of unleashing we need, and the front runners are absolutely fundamental to this. That, that's what the empirical research shows. And just my closing handout, which I think is something that um, we have been inspired also by the private sector, but also based on, on empirical evidence, is that sustainability has changed face entirely just over the past five, 10 years. It's no longer about protecting the environment and being morally responsible for all the richness and beauty in nature. It's that as well. But today we have so much evidence to show that if we really want to be successful, prosperous, healthy, peace, if we want to avoid migration, displacement and conflict, we want to go along a sustainable pathway. So the whole agenda is changing very rapidly. I sat with the German government just two days ago and the Minister for Science, Frau Kalishnikov. And next year, the science year in Germany will be about freedom. The theme will be freedom the whole year. And what do they want to have as centrally coupled to freedom? The planetary boundary science. Because we see more and more evidence that if you really, really want to have good outcomes for humanity, you want a stable planet. And that's where we are. So good luck with your innovations. It's so important. Thank you very much.
Wow, thank you, Johan Rökström. That was very insightful. And if you want to hear more about this, the book Earth for All will be in a goodie bag. Some of you were worried you're not going to get goodie bags because it's about sustainability. We got you. You're getting goodie bags for sure. So welcome everyone to Open Perspective. Everybody who's in this room and also to the ones who are watching online, very happy to have you here. My name is Leila Trulsen and I'll be the MC tonight. And when I got the question to be here today, I said yes immediately. And not just because I was hoping for some discounts or some of my favorite brands. It was also for the reason because I believe that these kind of platforms and network meetings is so important when you want to create change in the world. And we've all missed it after the pandemic, haven't we? So we are here today to discuss learnings and share learnings, but also mostly important solutions to be able to accelerate the transformation to an inclusive and positive fashion industry, planet positive fashion industry. It's also about networking that I mentioned. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize some people that was here in the audience when you leave and maybe there's somebody you follow on LinkedIn or you've read something they have written or you've met them in another event but haven't had the time to casually talk to them. Do take this opportunity because when you want to go far, you need to go together. So hopefully today can be another proof of just that. So you will also hear keynotes, panels discussing different challenges, but also tools to keep us moving forward. And we do hope that this will be eye-opening and perhaps give you all some new perspectives. This morning, the Global Change Award winners was announced. I don't know if any of you have read the news before you came here today, but you will meet them at the Innovation Showcase and you will celebrate them tonight at the award ceremony. Previous years, there used to be five winners, and this year it's 10 winners. That also means that the grant has gone up from 1 million euros to 2 million euros. So there's a lot to celebrate today for sure. Like I mentioned, this is a great program, so I'm going to keep it going. I want to introduce the global manager at H&M Foundation. She has extensive knowledge and over 15 years experience of working in between the intersection of sustainability and fashion. She was previously the head of sustainability at H&M Group, and she's all about setting and implementing action plans for a socially inclusive and planet positive industry. Give a round of applause for Anna Yeda. Thank you so much, Leila, and thank you to you, Johan, as well, for that incredibly important keynote. So, as the sign says, I'm Anna, and I'm the global manager for the H&M Foundation since December last year. So, in that sense, I'm a bit of a newbie in the world of philanthropy. But as Leila said, I've been working more than 15 years within the H&M Group, primarily with sustainability. So, I spend a lot of time thinking and working on the questions we'll discuss today, but more with a company hat on, so to say. So I'd like to start with just thanking all of you for being here today and for contributing with what I know you have a lot of knowledge and expertise and passion and later on tonight also dancing skills, I hope. So looking out at this amazing crowd, I see a lot of friends, amazing partners, but also some new faces that we of course look forward to get to know even more, which is also why we have a free bar later on tonight as well. So that's a good way to get started. But for those of you who are a bit more new to us, I can just mention that the h &M Foundation was started 10 years ago, back in 2013, by the Person family, who also founded the H&M Group. And the idea was really to contribute to positive change also beyond the company sphere. So today, the h &M Foundation works with the whole industry as a starting point, with the aim to make it social inclusive and planet positive. But just to Yuan's point earlier on, to us, this is not two separate destinations. This is really one holistic state where people and planet not just survive, but thrive thanks to one another. Now, exactly what such a state look like or the way the industry is going to get there is not what we have the details on. And nor do we think that that is our role. 
Instead, we listen to experts, researchers, scientists, other stakeholders who spent their lives in this field and that can paint that picture for us. And that's also why we're very proud supporter of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact, which is headed by Johan, and why we also support and collaborate with other research institutes, thought leaders, other like-minded organizations that can provide that knowledge and new insights and solutions that the industry need to transform. And it's then thanks to those insights and how we can be guided by those experts that we can identify the gaps and opportunity where we as a philanthropy can make a change. And here I think that we can play quite a different role compared to many other actors in the industry. So, for example, we're a non-profit. That means that we don't have to make any profit. We can be much more brave and courageous than what others might be able to be. And that means that we can invest and support innovation at a much more earlier stage than what brands or suppliers might be able to do. And in that sense, be that first spark that others can then come together and turn into something great. And that's also the whole idea behind the Global Change Award and the support that we want to provide to the amazing winners that we're going to come together and celebrate tonight. Another way that we as a nonprofit can use our unique role is also to try out new methods and new ways of working that might be a bit more difficult for others. One example is in India, where we have a program that focuses on waste pickers in the informal sector. So a very important, but also a very vulnerable group in these new circular supply chains that are growing. And in this program, we focus to enable the waste pickers to lift themselves out of poverty. And we do that by working not just with one, but actually with 10 different organizations that all address different needs that the waste pickers have identified. And even though these organizations work with their area of expertise and they do what they are best at, they also collaborate. They work together towards a joint agenda, towards shared goals, which really ensures that the impact that is created is done on a systemic level rather than within individual areas. Now, this method, which is called collective impact, is actually quite new to our industry. So we hope that by being a front runner, we might be able to pave the way for others and make it easier to follow, adopt and scale. And I also think that this is a good example of how we can work holistically and how we can support the industry transitions towards circularity in a way that really benefits both people and planet. So we started this day with this laser show that took you down to 2063, so 40 years down the road. And this time travel was not to make you feel old or to make you think about your bucket lists, but this was really to show what a possible textile future could actually look like. What is within reach if we dare to transform ourselves and the system? And creating these kind of inspiring stories and narratives, it's not just a packaging thing, it is actually a real agent for change. Research has shown that being in a positive emotional state increases creativity, ingenuity and problem solving. So it is a really important tool. And that is also why this has been a core component of the Foundation's work over the years. If you want to change the system, you need to change the narrative around it. And the power of the narrative is something you will hear more about from our final keynote speaker, Rachel Arthur. So, on a closing note, as Yuan was saying, and as we all know, we are at a pivotal point in time where our decisions and our actions really matter. All of us in this room are among those who can make a real difference. We have a unique role to play in this ecosystem of actors that's needed to transform the industry. That's a privilege, but it's also a huge responsibility. So our call to action would be to continue to listen to the experts around us, be guided by their insights, support and scale innovation in the ways that you can, address the systems and not the silos, and finally, but not the last part, be that story of change that can really help others to act. It's all down to us. Thank you.
Thank you. After that amazing speech, I don't want to let you off. <laughs> no, <laughs> yet. So I'm, hoping, snake. I'm hoping it's okay if I keep you on just a little bit. You mentioned when it comes to changing system, how important it is for, with storytelling and changing the narrative. Can you give us some concrete example of any results H&M Foundation has had when they've tried these methods? Yes, uh, I can give one example. Unfortunately, this happened way before my time, so I can't take any credit for that. But in 2021, we did something that was called the Billion Dollar Collection. And what it tried to address was really the gap we see today between the amount of fantastic innovations we have over here, but the lack of support and financial means that they need to scale. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to highlight that the problem, but do that in a constructive way. So we created the Billion Dollar Collection, a digital virtual collection of 10 different items that were all previous GCA winners. And with the help of Accenture, we managed to calculate what each and one of those beautiful products would actually contribute with in terms of social and planetal values uh, if they were able to scale. But we also calculated what is the investment gap? What are the money that is needed to take these innovations to scale? And then we created a lookbook that we sent out to a lot of investors and other similar organizations to both spark uh, awareness and increase their understanding of the role that they can really play, but also to inspire to action. And what we could actually see happened after that was that many winners were contacted by investors and they were more aware around the issues and, and so on. But we could also see that several of them were also being helped with closing some of their investment rounds. So it really goes to show the power that a positive narrative can have. The power of the positive narrative. Thank you very much, Anaya. Thank you. When we talk about change, I feel like innovation is always in the heart of change. And seeing is definitely believing. H&M Foundation has worked with innovation since 2015. And today I mentioned earlier that we're going to celebrate 10 new winners. But it's also important to look at the people who went before them that has great innovations that perhaps scaled a little bit since you saw them last. So we are going to hear some pitches from previous winners. There's going to be a total of six pitches today. And we're starting off with the uh, werewolf, the CEO and founder, Shui Lian Li. A big round of applause. Okay. Keep the applause going. Come on. Create it. Hi everyone, I'm Chewy Lee, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Wearable. Wearable is a biotechnology company that is mimicking the way nature creates color and function through protein structure to create the next generation of biodegradable performance textile fibers. So our company was founded on a question we were asked years ago, which was, how can biology change the future of fashion? And before I get into our technology, I would love to tell you guys a little bit about myself. I started out my career in the fashion industry, and during my role as a textile developer, I quickly learned um, how every single stage of production of the clothes that we wear and make have impacts on climate and biodiversity. And it was this frustration at the status quo that led me to look outside of our industry for answers, and to an introduction to a molecular biologist who, with a, with a vial of red fluorescent proteins, opened my eyes to the power of biology. Nature's organisms create function and aesthetics through proteins. And we can hack the DNA sequence that encodes for these proteins in a lab to create a whole new world of traits that we can apply to our textiles. Wasps have this protein in their saliva that can create natural waterproofing. The Discosoma coral has a protein that creates natural UV protection and this brilliant pink color. The Chinese softshell turtle has a protein in its eggs that creates natural antimicrobial properties. Where uh, nature has evolved such incredible strategies for color and function, and the tools of biotechnology allow us to create these proteins in a lab at scale. Wearable is harnessing nature's strategy to create um, low-impact textile fibers 
with functional color um, and performance properties that can be attributed to protein structure using protein engineering. We're offering the fashion industry the opportunity to reduce their carbon footprint through the use of renewable raw materials. We can eliminate the dyeing and some finishing stages of production from the supply chain altogether. And finally, our fibers will not contribute to microfiber or microplastic pollution. We are designing our fibers to degrade into building blocks for healthy ecosystems. So this is my amazing team um, that's bringing this idea into reality. We are scientists, designers, and engineers. And together, we see wearable as a platform technology that will create not just one kind of fiber, but an array of biodegradable performance textiles with traits like waterproofing, stretch, even color changing for a world where, where textile and Textile production and fashion does not have to be synonymous with environmental impacts. Thank you. That was amazing. Hands up if you learned something new from that. Yes, great, and everybody's awake. That's really good. And uh, next innovator, it comes from Ashaya, and is the founder, Anish Malpani. The same kind of applaud. Um, did you know that your favorite packet of chips, uh, the packet, is impossible to recycle? Um, it's called multi-layered packaging, or MLP. And it consists of many different types of materials squeezed or fumed to get, fused together, like plastic, aluminum, and paper. And it's very inconsistent. Different packaging, different brands, uh, different products all have different combinations, making it impossible to recycle. Less than 1% of this MLP is recycled globally. Um, it's honestly the worst kind of plastic waste. And in a country like India, the waste problem is a bit more complex. There are close to 4 million waste pickers who live really poor lives, um, not just from an income perspective, but they're low-caste migrant workers uh, working long, dangerous hours in garbage um, without PPE. And what's ironic is that it's because of them that we have really high recycling rates in India. Uh, but the stuff that doesn't get recycled is uh, your packets of chips, and that's where we come in. Um, we take these packets of chips, and our patent-pending process separates the layers and chemomechanically extracts building blocks and raw materials from it and converts them into high-quality materials. Our first material is hard poly-90. It's 90% recycled. It's extracted polyolefins from the worst kind of plastic waste. But this is not just a story. Um, we have close to virgin-like mechanical properties. Um, it's consistent, it's toxin-free, and most importantly, it's more recyclable than the original piece of MLP, extending the life. What's really unique about our process is that 50 to 75% of the process can be done by waste pickers. Um, we formalize these waste pickers into our supply chain, giving them dignified jobs, a higher income. And what's really cool is that they work right alongside our scientists and engineers on the same floor making this magic happen. Um, so when we got this material sorted out, the first thing we did was made the world's first recycled sunglasses from packets of chips. Um, and we uh, went a little, <laughs> thank you. Um, and we went a little viral and sold out our first batch, and it was it was great. Um, so the frames are made from this material; it's 90% recycled. But there's a QR code on the side that tells you the impact story. Um, when you scan this QR code, this is the web page that comes out. You get to see that this was made. One sunglass was made from five packets. These are the waste pickers that worked on it and how their lives have changed. Um, where the waste came from? Where exactly was that scrap shop? Um, where this waste came from? Um, and we really think it makes it the most sustainable product out there, not just from an environmental perspective, but also from a social perspective. Um, but sunglasses are not going to solve the waste problem. Um, it's just a proof of concept um, that you can take impossible to recycle plastic waste, make it into high quality materials and products, while empowering waste pickers into better livelihoods. Um, so our long-term goal is to work with uh, with lifestyle brands to build an array of products, um, like bags and purses and phone covers and slippers and <laughs> straps um, uh, uh, that are high quality and highly sustainable. And we're just getting started. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Anish Panashaya. I love that spontaneous round of applause you gave him. But poor guy, he had a timer. He's like, guys, I don't have time for this. <laughs> but that's also like, I would have loved to ask him some questions here on stage, because I got goosebumps when we talk about these kind of things. But it is a tight schedule, and this gives you even more of a reason to go out and talk to all of the innovators offer it. So promise you do that so you don't miss out on all of these great things. So let's talk about what role innovation can play. I feel like you already got a little bit of a sneak peek. All of this is about innovation. But we're going to talk a little bit in a panel about it. What role can innovation play in transforming this industry? All of the three panelists you're going to hear from are Global Change Award Expert Panelists 2023. So let me introduce the panel's moderator. She is H&M Foundation Strategy Lead Planet Positive, Christiane Dolva. Thank you so much. I feel I'm coming up here stating the obvious and like, what role can innovation play in this? And then you hear these guys and you're like, oh, yeah, I get it, a big role. But I want to invite my panelists up here to discuss some of the challenges that a lot of innovators uh, face when they want to scale. Because as Yuan Rockstam said, exponential transformation at scale is what we need. So without further ado, I would like to invite up on stage Carolyn Bryan, Brown, Managing Director at Ghost Loop Partner, uh, Miles Kubeka, Entrepreneur and Chief Executive Officer at Wakanda Food Accelerator, and Linda Greer, Senior Environmental Scientist and Impact Advisor. So thank you, not only for joining me here, but also for joining as expert panels for the Global Change Award, which for those of you who don't know it means that these guys have been part of scouting and researching and reading through a lot of applications uh, that led us to the winners that uh, we have this year. Just a quick introduction so you understand why I have all these brilliant minds up here, because this is going to be an insightful conversation, I'm sure. So Carolyn Brown here, to me, she embodies resilience, vision, and transformative leadership. She has a long career in the textile and fashion industry and a vast experience from that industry. And she's now running Close Loop Partners, which is a very forward-thinking investment firm that focuses on creating circular economy. And Miles over here, he is a true change maker. Uh, he is an embodiment of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, a known author, inspirational speaker, entrepreneur with a passion for humans, food and innovation, and also an inspiration, I know, to a lot of entrepreneurs out there. And then we have Linda Greer. And Linda, I considered you an extraordinary force of change. Uh, dedicating your life to preserving our planet and shaping a sustainable future. You're a very esteemed environmental scientist and activist, and throughout your career with groundbreaking research and advocacy, you've really paved the way for transformative policies and practices. So you see now why I have them here? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And as I touched on earlier, I want to have a conversation around the fact that we get goosebumps when we hear all of these fantastic innovative stories. And then we also know that entrepreneurs and innovators sometimes face a really long, hard road when they want to take their idea from scale, no, from idea to scale. So I wanted to start up with a question of like, what are some of the key challenges that you see? You all have different perspectives to innovation, maybe starting with you, Carolyn. Sure. I think one of the things about innovation is that it's not operating in an isolated silo. And what's key to its success is collaboration and deep partnership. So if you look at some of the diamonds that we just saw on the stage today and all of our finalists this year, those are fantastic innovative ideas. What has to accompany that is capital in whatever form that comes, whether it's foundational, grant, or investors 
followed by corporate support that can give these innovations an opportunity to put them in front of consumers. Mm. Obviously, consumer behavior that needs to embrace newness and be open to newness, and then finally shifting regulatory environments. So I think that what's really key in thinking about how to bring these innovations to scale early on is thinking about how you're managing that whole ecosystem, because the truth is it takes a village to get from lab to consumer. So what you're saying, it's not only enough if you as forward-thinking investors provide the capital. There needs to be a whole army of support around it. Absolutely. It takes a village. All parts are really important. And I can't underscore enough consumer behavior, which is something that you know is extremely hard to control. So all of those variables are great assets for acceleration or challenges to the business, depending on how you approach them early on. Mm -hmm. How about you, Miles, as an entrepreneur with a lived experience of bringing ideas to scale? What are some of the key challenges that you have faced or the entrepreneurs that you've worked with? Oh, people? there's a ton. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm from Africa, South Africa specifically, and one of the biggest things I see when I work with entrepreneurs, especially at a global level, um, is that obviously they work on solutions that are from their lived experience, and that makes sense. It's a natural inclination. But, you know, there's 40% of the world's population that lives below $2.50, right? Mm. That's a big base of the pyramid that has real solutions that no one is solving for. So, and what I often see is people creating solutions, almost creating problems and then creating solutions for them. Whereas my take, if you want to scale something, rather go find a problem that's already at scale and apply your, your intelligence, your science in solving for those problems. Because I think there is a huge opportunity that has been untested at that base. Mm, great. Find problems at scale. That's a good call out to everyone. How about you, Linda? Having worked so long in this industry, what are yeah, some of the challenges? Yeah, so I think that it's good to follow up on uh, what Miles had just said. One of the points that always strikes me is um, that these innovations have to be providing solutions to problems people think they have. And I think sometimes we skip over the uh, connecting of the dots between the very large scale climate problems that we heard about so eloquently when we kicked off today, and then how this particular solution will then help to solve that problem. And in some ways, it's a math problem, and it's just follow the tons. Um, how, you know, to, um, for the innovation to be able to make the case that this is this much less carbon, it is going to affect this much of the industry in terms of the reach of the type of fiber or fabric, and it's going to be able to scale to a certain level. And to sort of do that multiplication problem to make the case of the importance of the innovation, not just innovation for innovation's sake, which of course is very exciting, but to help connect the dots for why this innovation is so critically important right now. And Linda, you've told me you've worked in the textile uh, sector for a long time, and you told me that when you started looking at the textile sector, you were thinking that, well, I'll work on this for a couple of years, and then I'm, I'll, I've solved that. And then that I'm moving on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. To cement or something really exciting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you're still here. So are, is the change happening quick enough? And if not, why? Um, you know, I do think, well, I don't think the change is happening quick enough. Um, that's not just our industry here, but that's a lot of industries. I do, though, see a, a much greater sense of urgency than I saw even three or four years ago. I mean, sadly, I think that's because we see already the effects of climate change. And so along with the urgency, I think what we need now is to really focus strategically on where are the most important uh, areas for innovation so that it's not scattershot and that we can try to be very strategic in terms of where we really put our time and money and effort. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to add to that. I would, I would say we also need cross-group or cross-industry collaboration. I, I work in the food um, industry or ecosystem, and I can tell you for free, the challenges you face in fashion, I mean, are cut, copy, and paste in food. Mm -hmm. Like, even the terms we use are exactly the same. And in fact, even the innovations are starting to overlap, right? So why not have different industries working on the same solutions? Because some industries are slightly ahead on certain aspects and others are not. And, and also tell the stories. We need to tell positive stories. I think the fear-mongering is also starting to 
almost stun people from doing something, right? It's actually just the world is ending, too many things. It's, it, I think if we inspire people, we'll, we'll probably move a lot faster uh, than scaring them. Mm, such a good point to changing the narrative there. I mean, Carolyn, you've been working in this space both inside the industry and now as an investor. I'm imagining that you're meeting so many great innovators and entrepreneurs out mm -hmm. there. Do you have any success stories? Like, do you have any, like, what's the secret sauce, the key to get to scale? The magic key. Let me get the my magic key. Can you just my, give it? I brought my crystal ball, so okay, perfect, we're in luck. Um, so I, I would say one of the things I think we need to embrace more as a sector um, is not being shy about connecting the bridge between climate impact solutions and capital benefit for companies and individuals. And you know, I think it's a conversation that has not been so strong, but why isn't it a conversation? You know, when we look at some great solutions, they also happen to be amazing in terms of recapture of your raw materials, reuse of your raw materials being able to sell a product once, get it back, repair it, and sell it again with a different margin. Um, ability to connect with customers on a deeper level, to increase customer loyalty, to reduce attrition. I mean, these are all dollars in the bank for companies, right? And so I think as a sector, we've been a little bit shy to bring that conversation to the fore. But if you look at speed of adoption for solutions, that's an incredible accelerant. And so we always encourage our companies to you know, look in, in, and be very proud of their impact and really on top of their impact measurements, but also to say, okay, aside from impact, how is this good for all parts of the business and for all parts of an employee community? And that really can be a huge accelerant for growth. Mm, I think that's such a good point to dare to bring that aspect in and also just the job creation and the positive yeah. social impact that innovation can drive. These are job creators we have out here. Absolutely. No question. Fantastic. Linda, I know that you're involved uh, in another organization that also works hard on finding innovations for the textile industry, the Apparel Impact Institute. What what is what are you working on there, and where do you hope to find some keys to accelerate change and scale? Yeah, so the Apparel Impact Institute has a new effort that we call the Carbon Solutions Portfolio, and it's an effort very complementary to this one. So this one, I would say, is early stage innovation um, when companies are quite small, really maybe still at the lab scale. Um, what the Apparel Impact Institute is interested in is taking companies a little further along, which are really ready to scale. And what we want to do there, we're we're, um, it's called the Carbon Solution Portfolio, so we're focused on carbon. And what we're looking for really is um, um, solutions that have the data to show that they reduce carbon emissions. So it's a quantitative application of what is the amount of reduction, which is the effectiveness of the solution, what is the scope of the scale of the, uh, which we call um, the, the scaling of the, of, the, um, of the solution, and then how fast can it grow. And what our ambition is, is to move the needle. So looking at the total amount of greenhouse ga gas emissions associated with this industry and holding ourselves accountable to try to move the needle down. And to try to move that needle down by 2030, which is when many brands have carbon commitments to reduce by 45%, which is a very extremely ambitious reduction goal. Uh, and so I see this as a very hand-in-hand -hand effort with the H&M effort, um, because in our dream come true, some of the solutions that come in here first would then be fantastic applications to come next uh, for that scale-up moment. Mm, so there are actually some mechanisms out there trying to solve for that scaling with the sense of urgency. And it's not just the brand's targets that guide that, just as you once said. We have like six, seven years to ensure we get a safe landing. So mm -hmm. speed is at the essence. Time flies in good company, but I want <laughs> to acknowledge that this room is full of innovators, brands, mm -hmm suppliers, other important stakeholders in the industry. It's a, f it's a power force in here. And to your point, Caroline, that yeah. there are a number of different pieces that are needed. Maybe all of them exist in here. So if you were to use our final minutes here to send a key call to action to any of them, either all of them or you single out one of them, mm -hmm. what would that be? And Miles, I can start with you. Well, 
Um, well, I think we, we, we need to redefine um, problem statements um, and, and go back to the core. As a systems engineer, believe in first principles. Take out the noise and fundamentally understand what actually is the, pro is the problem. Because in my lived experience, I've often found that when I try and solve for a problem, uh, as well as, as, as an entrepreneur, I always find that the problem is not the problem. It's the problems around the problem <laughs> that are the actual problem. <laughs> so true. That's so, a um, so as a key takeout, I, you know, uh, I think it's an ecosystem systems thing. I think you called it adjacencies. Um, let's work in a more collaborative uh, way to try and fix systemic problems. Uh, otherwise, we'll just keep sustaining them um, instead of fixing them. Mm. The problems of the problems. Linda, any key send away? I guess my uh, final word would be follow the tons. Um, how much impact are you going to be able to have, how fast are you going to be able to have it, and make the case that this is going to be a significant innovation to help the world. Mm -hmm. Caroline, you get Great. the last final words. Well, no pressure. I would say that we all in this room have a really exciting role to play, and every piece of this pie is extremely important. But I want to send one message directly to the early stage innovators in the room, which is to think very, very carefully about the foundational decisions you make in your company, even at early stage. They may not seem important today, but as you grow, how your IP is structured, how your team is structured, how your cap table takes shape early on is what allows these partners of the future to come into your business and help you or not. So I always say, may seem like small potatoes today, but it will grow, and those will become, become either meaningful accelerants or meaningful issues. Thank you. And that's really the ambition of the H&M Foundation as well, is to, throughout the whole Global Change Award program, support the innovators, fill their toolbox to allow them to scale. But remember that all of these new ideas they are pieces of a toolbox for the industry. So I guess if I get to get a little bit of a call of action, it would be be curious about those tools. Start picking them up and use them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that panel. And indeed, this is a powerhouse in the building. I don't know about all of you, but I can't wait to, in my day-to-day -day life, use the saying, is the problem really the problem, or is the problems around the problem that's the real problem? <laughs> Not sure what setting I'm going to use it in, but I'm sure I can use it in quite a few settings. We're going to continue with the innovations. And uh, next up is uh, Resortex and the founder and CEO, Cedric Van Hook. A round of applause. <laughs> Yes, yeah, now you hear me, that's better, right? I'm Cedric from Resortex, as you just heard, and we make recycling easy. We make garment-to-garment -garment recycling possible at an industrial scale. Garments, they are difficult to recycle, right? But that's only because they're difficult to disassemble. Manual disassembly, it's slow, costly, um, not scalable. And mechanical disassembly has a tendency to harm the textiles, and so then you get up into downcycling. That's why more than 90% of garments end up on landfills around the globe. And a chunk of those garments even have price tags still attached to them. Because on top of that, unsold inventory is a very big problem. It's a $4.3 billion problem for one brand alone. To tackle all of this, the European Commission also starts to set new rules. We have the extended producer responsibility, we have the leftover destruction ban, and we have the eco-design directives that all put pressure on this industry. So if you're a brand and you want to be compliant with this new legislation, you need to start designing and producing garments for recycling today. So what if we could reduce this cost of this unsold inventory, help those brands become compliant again, and simultaneously make all those garments recyclable? Meet Resortex, a globally patented solution that we are validating with a lot of big, like lots of players in this fashion industry. It is also sold by major brands in more than 60 countries. 
It starts with Smart Stitch. That's the first part. Those are a system that allows you to design garments for disassembly um, by simply changing the stitching thread. Those heat dissolvable stitching threads melt down, making seams automatically disappear without having you to think about changing designs or production and while still being able to wash, dry, and iron your garments. Then comes smart disassembly. Those are patented thermal systems, so special ovens in which you can take apart five times quicker tons of garments without harming the textiles because of a low oxygen chamber and other kind of technologies, as well as keeping energy consumption as low as possible thanks to the closed loop heating system that we use. The pilots that we did with those brands also showed that Resortix is not only a key solution to unlock garment to garment recycling, but also outperforms traditional disassembly, um, but even generates also profits uh, at low return rates. A brand can start to earn money from selling sorted textile waste as feedstock on the recycling market. Our life cycle assessment shows that we can reduce um, by coupling recycling with Resortex up to 50% the CO2 emissions, 80% the waste, and 98% water consumption in this industry. And we are at a stage now where with the smart stitch capacity that we have to produce 20 million products a year and the smart disassembly capacity for 9 million products a year, we are ready to scale with sorters, brands, and recyclers that are willing to remain competitive in this industry. Resortix, the technology is so hot, it will melt your mind. <laughs> Thank you, Cedric, and thank you, Resortech. Next up, we have Paul, the founder and the CEO, Ankit Agarwal. A round of applause. Every year, India's 1.6 million manual scavengers jump neck deep into clock sievers and scrape human feces from dry toilets. It's a very big taboo. People don't want to even talk about it. When I was 16, I came across this population. Large, suffering, but invisible. I promised myself to bring change. Years later, I found it full, where we employ women from the manual scavenging community to collect waste flowers from temples in India that would otherwise be dumped into River Ganges. We give a new life to these flowers. We convert these pesticide-laden flowers into the world's first charcoal-free incense and an animal-free and alternate to animal leather called Fleather. Fleather is a biomaterial that behaves exactly like animal leather, is water wicking. You can fine tune its properties to, for its tensile strength, elasticity, 3D features, any kind of color, pattern, anything that you want. Our dream is to make animal leather obsolete. We are beginning by transforming the leather industry, the fashion industry. As of today, we collect around 22 tons of flour waste from six cities in India and employ 455 women full-time, ensuring health benefits, fair wages, retirement benefits, and even a busing service. The radical idea, based on principles of inclusive circularity, not only provides dignified livelihoods to my people, but a life of dignity and respect. I'm on the path of changing the fashion industry. My work is not just about cleaning the waste on the lands, but also about cleaning what our earlier generations have done. Please join me on this journey. Thank you. Thank you to Fall. From floral waste to leather, that's a change I wasn't really prepared to, but I'm loving it. Because when we do talk about innovation, that's actually what we're looking for, some way of changing the current system. And uh, change is an impo important part of that. But the system is large. The system is complex. We've spoken about some of the different sectors you're all sitting in. So it's hard to showcase all of that in one panel. 
but uh, we will showcase some of the different parts of the system. We'll discuss what kind of barriers we're facing and most important, how do we overcome it? That question leads us to the next panel, Changing the System, which is led by Hasmin Malik Chua from Sourcing Journal. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine Malik Chua, Sourcing and Labor Editor at Sourcing Journal. I'd like to invite my uh, panelists, Anne Runnell, founder and CEO of uh, Reverse Resources, Anand Ahuja, head of operational development at Shahi Exports and co-founder of the Good Business Lab, and Rana Chow, CEO of Novel Investor Partners and the Baixian Asia Institute and chairperson of Novatex. <laughs> Great. So Rana, you created the Billy Upcycling System uh, to generate new fibers from textile waste. What's one system, Barry, that you've encountered through your work there uh, that you would like to change? We've encountered so many, so many <laughs> system barriers. I narrow it down. <laughs> and it's difficult to focus on one. Uh, but one of the biggest ones, I think, um, that has really surprised us is um, the somewhat reluctance um, uh, to kind of go closed loop and buy back the fibers that we upcycle by brands. Um, many of our customers in our conventional yarn business would come to us, um, offer to give us their unsold inventory um, because they're looking for a solution to take care of that excess inventory. Uh, but they are not as keen to buy back the upcycled yarn because they're always looking at prices, quality, um, and, and another issue that we always face is the uh, unwillingness or inability to sort before they give us all this um, excess inventory. So that's one thing that I really, really would love to see a major change in the fashion industry. Yeah. So we'll talk about solutions in a bit. So um, Anand, you've talked about how social innovations don't receive the same attention as environmental ones. Can you talk us through where you think the white spaces are uh, and, and why we need to invest time into the nuances you know, in terms of political, geographical, and economic contexts? Yeah, sure. I think uh, sustainability is both environmental and social. And social sustainability is about creating impact for people. Um, <clears throat> I think when it comes to the barriers in terms of advancing uh, or making progress on social sustainability, there's challenges in measurement. Uh, there's a lack of evidence. It's hard, to, it's hard to measure in the short term the impacts of social in, uh, innovations or social programs. And there's also um, like you said, a need to understand the local context. Mm -hmm. So the innovation has to be, the, you need to be on the ground uh, designing solutions with understanding of the local context, uh, the challenges people face, the way they operate, the way they behave. You can't necessarily create a social innovation in one country and then just place it in another place. You have to have that local context. So those are some of the barriers, I think, in terms of why we haven't advanced as much on a lot of these social and labor issues. Right. It's difficult to, to quantify you know, labor aspects compared to like, environmental ones where you have like, fixed data yeah. points. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, there are ways to, to measure. And you know, uh, we've done some of this work at Shahi. We've helped incubate. Uh, a good business lab, a labor innovation company, where essentially we do conduct uh, trials, experiments to test these impacts. But you know, there's a large upfront cost in doing it. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. So there needs to be a willingness in investing in creating the evidence also. Yeah, absolutely. So, Anne, you see data and digitalization as the key to, uh, well, in terms of waste flows, as key to a circular economy. Where is the industry falling short on this right now? I think it's, uh, I, I would be so bold to say that the industry is underestimating the power of digitization also be, uh, from the angle of uh, 
uh, using business cases and incentives, like why would we want to use digital platforms to create uh, exchange of information and, and better processes and rewiring the industry to create the uh, circular economy because we, in a circulation, we are dependent on the different parts of the industry to work together. And collaboration needs that real-time data exchange. But when we talk about digitization, too often we talk about just doing some reporting, not understanding how we actually need to talk about digital tools that allow that collaboration in a smart way. Why am I, um, what am I getting in return of offering accurate data that is perfectly necessary for the other party on the other side? It takes a bit of understanding this digitization in a different way. Yeah, I think there's some overlap with what Anna was talking about with the social problems too, because waste picking is largely an, an informal um, situation, right? Yes. Can you talk a bit more about that and where the challenges lie? Um, yeah, like in the example of reverse resources, we uh, at some point understood that the whole trading of waste um, is based on the business case of brokering of waste from uh, making money from the price, price difference. And in the combination of giving them an, a different business case of offering a service while digitally connecting the suppliers of waste, uh, factories, garment factories, the cutting waste with recyclers, we, we managed to kind of change both the business case, actually make a better business case for the traders, whereas also giving data and transparency for the industry. So it's kind of, that's an example where we had a combination of both environmental impact as well as social impact. Right, so we don't wanna leave the audience feeling hopeless. <laughs> so let's talk about some solutions um, that there are possible. Uh, I like to ask that for each of my panelists, you know, to describe an intervention that, that you've done uh, to tackle the issue that you just described. Let's start with Rana. Um, I, I don't know if it's an active intervention that we engaged in, but um, some of the speakers earlier mentioned um, storytelling and the importance of collaboration and going beyond you know, your, your industry. So in our early days, of course, we focused on uh, working with people in our industry, in the apparel industry, in the fashion industry, um, especially in yarn making and sweater making. And when that didn't really pick up as much momentum as we expected, we just went on to this um, uh, really kind of uh, a big effort on storytelling um, we actually hired a third-party PR company to help us create the story uh, and then reach out to um, um, other players uh, beyond, our, beyond our normal reach. So very surprisingly um, and happily, we received a lot of um, queries from the F&B and hospitality industries. So hotels, for instance, restaurants, uh, they would come to us uh, very eager with their textile waste. And to us, actually, it was wonderful because you can just imagine all these white sheets, all these towels, they're all the same color, same quality, large quantities. Um, and then they also had a very um, um, focused, intentional uh, effort to reuse the recycled and upcycled fibers. So they came to us with programs that they wanted to make uh, you know, products with, with the upcycled yarn and fibers and then to use it for more educational purposes. So that's one, one example of a very good kind of across the board collaborative uh, um, efforts. And also, you know, don't give up when, when things are kind of not going your way in the beginning and just kind of keep, keep pushing forward. And that's how you were able to create additional value to your product. Exactly. And then of course that feeds back into the fashion and apparel industry because when then we have more stories to tell uh, yeah. to our branded apparel customers. Yeah, absolutely. Anand, what about you? Well, I think you know um, that's a great example of how manufacturers typically have been behind the scenes, but taking proactive measures to kind of push this agenda forward. One of the ways in which we've done this, we've understood that, um, well, first of all, you know, in the industry, in the fashion industry, there's huge impacts on the environment. There's also huge impacts on people. Mm -hmm. It's a labor intensive business. We employ tons of people, um, in India specifically women. So 
understanding all of that, we see an opportunity to say, okay, how can we use this uh, industry to kind of address a lot of these global challenges? So at Shahi, like I was mentioning, you know, we've taken some initiatives to work on the social issues. Um, obviously, we're the direct employers of tons of workers. So by um, having that employment, having that connection, we're able to sort of understand the challenges they face, or at least take the measures to understand uh, those challenges, then design solutions to the problems they may have. One such example is around soft skill training. In 2007, um, Gap Inc. and Shahi worked together to launch the PACE program, and that's a soft skill training for, for female garment workers. And so a good business lab came in. We conducted an experiment to test the impacts. We found huge impacts on the program. Uh, workers were able to actually improve their stock of soft skills through this training. And then in doing so, you know, that drove up their um, efficiencies, their attendance, um, you know, their willingness to invest in their children's education. So all these sort of both social and business, uh, you know, um, factors were able to, uh, we were able to observe the impacts on those. Similarly, we're doing a bunch of work on worker voice and, you know, health and other, and other topics. But I think uh, with this approach, there is definitely hope that um, we can look at these problems, find solutions, and you know, turn them into uh, yeah. opportunities. And there's a good business case. I mean, like happier workers are more productive workers as well. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's tons of programs out there. If we're going to scale programs up, we need to be investing in the ones that have impacts. Mm -hmm. But then in order to know that, we need to like, spend the resources to, exactly. to test and evaluate. Um, so once we know a program has impact, then of course we should uh, invest in scaling it up. Yeah. So Anne, what's one hopeful um, takeaway that our audience members can leave with that you've that you've tried? Um, I can say today that rewiring the business case with digital support and processes uh, across a large network of collaborators starts to move mountains. Mm -hmm. um, we started from the question of uh, how can recyclers access large quantity of similar waste, whereas today they are dependent on buying it from traders with no background information. I gave the example of changing the business case of the traders, but that's also we needed to get garment factories to segregate waste mm -hmm. at the cutting table and keep cotton waste separate. So there was a need for um, process change in the factory side. And even though we could so show to them that they are getting more money for it, they, they, it's still a side business um, next to actually producing garments. So then we had to um, get brands involved. And, and we, had, uh, we have been working with different programs, projects, where groups of brands actually collaborate to, to invite their suppliers to start segregation of waste. Um, at source, and uh, that has created a movement uh, where waste is now uh, becoming a clean resource in large volumes for recyclers, and that's shifting the whole industry. And that all started from showing to each party in the ecosystem how they can benefit from and, and how can they can trust exchange of uh, relevant information between each other. Yeah, that's interesting. Can you talk about trust and how, how to best create it and why it's important? I've been talking about Estonian uh, e-governance as a good example of how trust can be created, where when you take um, a central role of governing who has access to which piece of information at which level, and, and you, you build a trust around the data security, um, so it does, like, often we see in fashion industries the mindset that if I share my data, mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, visible for everybody. Mm -hmm. But it's not that. It's, it, it, you can govern that. Um, and, and through that, start building that trust. And that's where you can always have these layers that there, this is my information, this piece I share with that party, this goes into an aggregated pool, the aggregated data becomes valuable for everybody. And, and that's where we can create collaboration across a large network of players in a very different level. Wonderful. We have like a minute and a half left. Uh, Rana, maybe some advice to our audience? <laughs> um, advice. Uh, maybe just one 
closing comment. Um, I would like to be put out of business at some point because there's no excess inventory, not because people aren't willing to, to talk about their excess, right? And I think currently that's what we're facing a lot. There are a lot of brands out there with a lot of excess. Um, they probably don't even know how to deal with it themselves because it's been accumulating for years. I mean, from my part of the world, I know uh, there are actual stories of warehouses of, of stuff um, accumulated over the years. Um, so it's almost too difficult for them to address this issue and therefore just put it aside uh, for, for a while longer. And, and so just like Linda said earlier, the changes aren't happening quickly enough and I think we just need to go at all angles, bring everything up um, to the surface, help uh, give more solutions, not just the problem, but attack the problems around the problems. I, I learned a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> so Anand, what about you, last words? I would just say, you know, if our goal is impact at scale as leaders, let's invest in creating evidence and then use, uh, and then scale up the evidence-based programs. Wonderful, and we are just on time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you to my wonderful panelists. Why did the applause die out when I got on stage? Come on, can you keep them up a little bit more? Give me some. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Even the music continues. That was very kind. Uh, we have two more innovators that we're going to hear from. So let's give them the best applause we've heard so far today. To Gali, the best. Wow, you were early. <laughs> I'm liking that. Gali, who is a business analyst. Um, sorry, Gali's the company business analyst. Chloe Goldman, best applause, yeah. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Chloe. I'm part of the business development team at Galley. Today, I'm going to tell you about how we create products from cells in a facility instead of plants on the field. So across our platform, we have products within the food and beverage industry, as well as apparel and textiles. Today, I'll be talking about our cotton fiber, which we call literally cotton. All our products do tie back to our vision, which is to save the planet by transitioning the world to cellular agriculture. Now, Gali was founded in response to the effects of the climate crisis on our environment and on our communities and how that effect is compounded when you add in the unsustainable and unpredictable practices that go with traditional agriculture. This says things like deforestation, biodiversity loss, and many more. And so we believe that lab-grown cotton is the solution. We're sustainable and traceable. We use significantly less resources and we could trace back to the source. We're predictable and reliable, so we can control all lab conditions. It's like having the perfect weather year round, and it allows us to dramatically decrease lead time. A powerful platform, anything you produce in a, lab, in a farm, we can grow in a lab. Customizable quality. So because we can control things like genetic makeup, as well as environmental conditions, we see a future in which we can enhance fiber, cotton's current properties, or add in new ones to create a completely new fiber experience. Finally, we have full control of COGS and CAPEX, and this allows us to have cost predictability. So we use about 80% less resources compared to conventional cotton producing methods. This does account for water, land, and carbon dioxide emissions. And when you translate this over into an acre by acre comparison, we are actually 500 times more efficient. Regarding our process, the first thing we do is isolate cells from a plant source. We're then going to take these cells and bring them through a sea train, going all the way from a petri dish up to a bioreactor. And throughout that process, we're going to ensure they have the perfect conditions to keep our cells happy and to keep them thriving. From there, we're then going to harvest and dry the product, and we're going to get the fiber that you see on the rightmost side of the page. We have 16 patents protecting our core capabilities. This is going to make sure we are and stay a key player within the cell ag space, but also that we are the first mover within plant cell culture specifically. We will also be creating facilities that can be placed anywhere around the world, allowing us to get as close as possible to clients' existing supply chain and decrease transportation emissions in the process. Of course, none of this would be possible without our fantastic team. We're a team of 50 plus across two offices, one in Brazil, one in the US and Massachusetts, an amazing SAB, and a really supportive group of, of investors that includes John Doris, Sam Altman, Sergey Brin, and Tony Fidel. And that brings me to my last point, which is, are you ready to save the world with us? Thank you. 
Ben. Thank you, Chloe from Galley. Next up, we're going to hear from Biostore, and it's the founder and CEO, Wyatt Hussein. Give him a warm applaud. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vajahat, and I'm the founder and CEO of BioRestore. Our solution restores worn out clothes back to new with a single wash. But it's not going to be who's going to do the talking. We've got a very special guest today, Eric, one of our customers who tried our product, and he wants to talk to about it. <laughs> yes, hello, my name is Eric. And uh, basically, I'm a technician. And uh, so interesting to hear a lot about that. But my technical background is I've been working on internet and playing guitar also. And I mean, internet from the beginning was nothing. As a technician, we used the internet, but there was no content. So I mean, you are filling this with content. Second, you need a standard. On the internet, we had border gateway protocol, so all the world could communicate with each other. And also, as a technician, I read the mag magazine New Technic. It's the biggest one in Sweden. And I read an article about Bio Restore. <laughs> and it was also on a technical level how they do with these enzymes and things like that. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I got a packet. And as a technician, I read the manual. OK. One, put it in the washing machine. Your favorite sweaters. OK. And second, add this. Yeah. After that, I went out in the sun, had a cup of coffee. The wash was ready, and I pulled it out. Oh, my favorite sweaters. <laughs> they look like almost new. But I took them out in the sun, they dried, and I took it on. Oh, it was like I was 10 years younger. <laughs> At the same moment, I bought my favorite sweater. So I went to the local pub with my sweater, and they said, oh, you look wonderful today. <laughs> what happened with you, Eric? Well, uh, yeah, I had my favorite sweater on. And if you are, uh, have your favorite sweater, you are shiny. But I also learned that be restore by using that, I reduce the waste of textile waste and saving water. Thank you so and much, Eric. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to us. Well, you missed the rest. <laughs> hey, a big round of applause for them again. <laughs> <laughs> the power of your favorite sweater and a happy customer. I wonder if he still has to pay for the product. Uh, anyway, if you love this product or you want to know more about it because you think you're going to love it, I've got some good news. You're getting samples in the goodie bag I mentioned before. And I hope I'm getting a good goodie bag as well because that looks amazing. An applaud was on his way. I'm not the one to kill an applaud. Let's give it again, though. Today has been interesting. It wasn't that long ago that we had Anna Yeda on stage, but when you get a lot of new information and inspiring things, it feels like it was forever ago. So let me give you a little bit of a reminder. She spoke about the importance of changing the narrative when you want to change the system. And she also gave you a little bit of a glimpse to a keynote that's coming, kind of, going to come from Rachel Arthur and the fact that she was going to go a little bit deeper into this topic. Because the stories we tell and how we communicate, it changes both our view of the world 
world, how we feel about our place in it, but also our ability to actually change it. So how can we use communication as a tool to strive for change? And also we're going to get a little bit of a sneak peek into the UNEP's uh, fashion playbook. So to our last keynote speaker today, a warm applaud, Rachel Arthur. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. So I'm here today to talk to you about storytelling, which I think you will all have um, gleaned is the red thread or perhaps the green thread running through today's event. We started, of course, with that really beautiful, immersive audio narrative as to what our world of textiles could look like in 2063. But I want to explore why us deciding upon that narrative in 2023 is so fundamental to the change that we want to see. Stories are the basis of the world in which we live. They inform everything to do with us and who we are as individuals, as communities, as societies, and as a species. They inform how we understand the world, how we interpret other people's version of it, and of course, how we act within it. Each of you are individual nodes in a million different stories, but collectively, your stories also make up the reality of which we're all a part. As we heard from Anna and we have heard repeated several times today, there is no truer phrase than the power of storytelling. So let's step for a moment and have a look at the stories that we in this room are surrounding ourselves with in this industry. Progress, change, evolution, revolution, transformation, hope. All of you here today are, I hope, bought into this idea of how fashion's story is going how it is changing for a new narrative that is indeed a positive one, that gives us creativity in a circular and regenerative world. It's a really promising tale, but of course it's not yet the dominant one. After all, let us not forget that the dominant story still looks much more like this. Newness, discounts, cheap, quick, disposable, that our sector is one of extraction and exploitation, of overproduction and overconsumption. This is the story growing the fastest around the world, especially as we welcome more and more people into the rising middle class. All of us are being force-fed this notion of buy, 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 produce, consume, consume. It's about material wealth and status based on ownership. It's about constantly pushing the notion of more. It makes sense. It's a story that has worked for business, for economies. A story that has been phenomenally successful based on the notion of infinite growth. Through that lens, this is a narrative and a system that has triumphed. But this is not a story that enables us to reach the goals we have before us today. We cannot keep doing it. We have to tell a new story. Now, we all know in this room how fashion is contributing to the triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste, not to mention the intellect issue of social injustice. In our work at the UN Environment Programme, changing consumption rates, incre increasing consumer knowledge, and shifting consumer behaviours are one of the core pillars of driving systems change to not only reduce the overall impact of the sector, but make it a positive force within the world we all want to see. Which means that we need to show that a different way is possible. Fashion is one of the most powerful marketing engines on earth. It inspires self-expression, identity, belonging. 
It informs values and shapes the very notion of desire and aspiration. Imagine if we could redirect that entirely towards sustainability. If we can change this narrative, as we've heard, we can change our future. Which is why all of you are here today, because in some way, shape, or form, you want to help drive change. And you can, because you are the ones that help make these stories come to life, no matter what your role is. You write them, you create them, you shape them, and you most definitely inform them. And so today, we want to see how you might also start to shift them. Let me tell you how big a creative opportunity this is. We need every piece of talent this industry has to help. And that starts with bringing those who get these stories in front of consumers to join us at the table. The marketers, storytellers, artists, image makers, role models, writers, creators, designers, influencers, advocates, and more. The list goes on. We need them to help us envision what this new world looks like, to paint a picture of that incredible future narrative in order for us to truly bring it to life. After all, a positive fashion future is entirely possible. The stories we tell now, individually and collectively, all need to point consumers towards sustainable, circular lifestyles in order to help meet the sustainable development goals. And it really is a beautiful thing to imagine. As the textile in 2063 audio inspired us with, digital, one of a kind, regenerative, on demand, de-threaded, re-threaded, seeded, tested, healed, redone. Later this month, uh, the UN Environment Programme and UN Climate Change together will launch a playbook that provides a guide to taking action for a new fashion narrative. For the first time in this sector, we are not only spotlighting the importance of the role of communicators as enablers and drivers of systemic change, but showing them how to help make it happen. Its key messages include that we must portray alternative models of status and success, recalibrating what it is that we aspire to. We must social proof a sustainable future. We must eradicate messages of overconsumption and instead point consumers towards lower impact options and cir circular solutions. We must extinguish all forms of misinformation and greenwashing. We must explore, explain, and celebrate the way in which fashion is deeply and positively intertwined with nature, with rich cultural heritage, and with diverse communities. We must learn from the wisdom and traditions that can be found in the Global South. And we must empower consumers into their role as citizens to interrogate and demand greater action from businesses and policymakers alike in all walks of life. We can use our power in turn to help support that dialogue that is needed for political change. And importantly, we must do all of this to help accelerate a just transition towards a sustainable and circular future. And we must do it now. This isn't about doom and gloom. It's not about sacrifice or shame. It's still saying that we can enjoy fashion. It's just changing the how. And let me tell you that this is where it gets exciting. Because so long as we back it with science, with what that, sorry, what that how looks like is really, really still up for grabs. Some people are telling these stories already, whether it's through products, branding, media, events, innovations, whole businesses, big and small. As we saw at the beginning, this message is present and it's growing. Now we need to supercharge it. So this is a call to action. Every single one of you in this room has a role to play in helping to shift the narrative. You can decide what it looks like. It's only fairy tales that have a beginning, middle, and an end. 
In reality, all of the stories we create keep evolving. So let's move ours in the right direction. What we need is the stories that tell us that this can be beautiful, energizing, rewarding, that it can enable well-being and prosperity for all. Those are the stories that we should all be seeing, reading, ingesting, and engaging with. And that's where the creative opportunity lies. Through its cultural reach, powers of persuasion, and role as an educator, not to, not to mention the incredible ability to generate demand and desire, fashion communication, when directed the right way, can both raise awareness and drive a shift towards a more sustainable and equitable industry. And that's what ex is exciting. All of us can help shift the narrative, and yes, that means you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And I hope you all are taking a photo of this right now as well, because <laughs> this is all about starting the conversations and the change. I, I came up here with the intention to ask you what we can change in our communication to strive to that change. But I felt like you gave pretty good principles here. But there were a lot of good ones. Mm. Sometimes the difficult part is knowing where to start, like the small things that actually makes a diff big difference. Can you pinpoint one of the things you really want people to take with them from the principles you just mentioned? Yeah, and you'll have to forgive that the pyramid is obviously quite hard to see in there, but the, the entire playbook will launch in just three weeks' time. Um, I think to answer your question, I mean, the pyramid is designed as a pyramid because that, that foundational layer is about science, right? We, we have to have that part right. The information has to be evidence-based. It has to be absolutely accurate. So I think mm. we start there. But I feel like for people in the room, that's table stakes. We know that already. That foundational layer is absolutely where we are, where we're moving. And I think the next layer, the piece around changing behaviors and reimagining values, redirecting aspiration, desire, celebrating celebrating those sort of cultural elements of this industry is the place where the creativity begins and becomes really, really exciting. So I think with that call to action, what I'd say to everybody in this room is like assess your role in the communication ecosystem. If you think you don't have one, you're wrong. <laughs> you absolutely do. And if it's not directly related to your job, you've got an amazing ability to go to the people within your organization who it is. You know, please take this to them and say to them to read it and, and, and ingest it. Um, you, you know, you have a lot of a lot of power to help shape what this narrative is. Mm. I've seen a lot of people nodding during the time you've spoken, so I feel like your message has really gone through. Thank you once again, to Rachel Arthur. Thank you. Time flies when you're having fun, as the saying goes. Uh, I want you all to continue the conversation with the speakers tonight uh, at City Hall. Everybody's invited. I'm sure you've gotten information about it. But also outside, we have a group of innovators. We have both the, let's see if I can get a map up here behind me, and I can even pinpoint it, like an air hostess pointing at the exits, etc. Um, that's going to come. That's going to come. It's not that big of a place. You won't get lost. But we have both the new winners and we have previous winners as well. We have them in that room over there and that room over there. We have some Fika. So make sure that you grab onto that person that you've been dying to talk to the whole day. Um, we also have gift bags that I mentioned that will be at the door on your way out. Uh, I think we came into quite an interesting setting. And I just realized I haven't even mentioned that amazing laser beam show kind of setting the scene. And I hadn't seen it before either. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting that they mentioned in it was that the change happened when people felt empowered and brave enough to go even further, to dare to go even further. And then we have Johan Rekström that came up in here and talked about the positive tipping point. So I hope that you continue to meet people that brings that out of you, the positive tipping point. Maybe some of the conversations or collaborations that's coming out from this meeting that you're going to have today uh, will actually be a part of your change. So perhaps 2063 will be our reality. I want to thank you all who watched online and everybody who's here. And I want to end this fantastic day with a short film. Do you feel that? 
there's a whole world out there waiting to change. Wanting to change. Hello. A world that wants to move from outdated business models, unfair societies, and the take-make-waste approach that has come to define it, and instead become a world powered by care and respect for people and planet. The textile industry has been part of the problem and is part of the solution. Reimagined and remodeled it can contribute to building inclusive societies and lead the way to planet positive action. Pioneering circularity, driving new technologies, helping to improve the lives of those most vulnerable, and helping to reform old societal patterns. H&M Foundation exists to accelerate this shift. We find, fund, and facilitate innovations and initiatives that disrupt the status quo and enable the change. And it's working. Lab-grown cotton exists and reduces the need for farmland, water, and pesticides. Waste pickers are becoming an acknowledged part of circular economy. New technology can now make garments from CO2 in the air. And women garment workers are becoming skilled machine operators as the industry modernizes. But things need to scale up and speed up. Let's not keep the world waiting.